This is the Ultra Running History Podcast. I'm your host, Davey Crockett. Thanks. Thanks for coming. This is episode 41, continuing the stories of walking around the world. In this episode, I will tell three bizarre true stories about globetrotters, including the true tale of a man who walked wearing an iron mask. Wow. Maybe I should try to do this podcast episode wearing an iron mask. Okay, here it goes. It seems to be a bit claustrophobic in here. (laughs) Hey, it's stuck and getting warm in here. I can't get it off. Help! (laughs) Thanks. Well, I did have it on for about a minute. (laughs) Just like the around the world fakes, I'll twist the story and tell people I had it on for days. Well, shall we call it a night? Might as well. Certainly wouldn't call it a show. (laughs) (laughs) Quit while you're ahead. And now, friends, (laughs) commercial time. Remember, if dandruff is your problem, ask for Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo. It's the only shampoo made whose guarantee to remove dandruff is backed by one of the world's largest insurance firms. No other shampoo can make this statement. Ask for Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo at your drug or toilet goods counter, beauty or barber shop. Fitch is spelled F-I-T-C-H. We now return to your regular programming. Now to the bizarre around the world stories. Before returning to more serious ultra running history, three more around the world on foot tales must be told. These stories are so bizarre that they are hard to believe, but they did happen. These individuals gave up years of their lives to gather attention by walking thousands of miles, enduring much hardship. Eventually, as world conflict exploded into World War I, much of what the public thought was nonsense disappeared for a time. While wager conditions surrounding all three were hoaxes, the extreme walking efforts that took place were genuine. Attention was given worldwide to their efforts. Commenting on one of them, it was written, He is one of the oddest of the cranks that have ever started to go around the earth. The man in an iron mask was a prisoner held in a French prison during the 1600s. Books, theatrical plays, and movies have been produced involving his story. In 1847, Alexander Dumas, author of The Three Musketeers, wrote a fictional tale about the man in the iron mask which captured the imagination of readers in the 19th century. Who was the man in the iron mask? What terrible truth about him so threatened the King of France that he personally ordered the prisoner kept in almost complete isolation, forbidden even to speak his own name? In 1908, word came from England about a bizarre around-the-world walk that had begun involving a man in an iron mask. A news report included... When the average English newspaper is looking hard for a genuine, unmitigated ass, it's a plucked Canadian dime to a double eagle that it will settle on an American millionaire. Indeed, it was believed that an American multimillionaire put up $100,000 for a person to walk around the world in very unusual circumstances. The conditions included that the man must wear a mask, keeping his identity a secret for the entire journey. In addition, he must start with less than five dollars, earn money along the way, get a signature from town officials from every town he entered along with a cancelled postage stamp, must push a perambulator or a baby carriage, and must find a wife along the way. A man in England took up the challenge and encased his head in a black iron mask of the fashion of the Middle Ages and started from London's Trafalgar Square on January 1st 1908. He pushed a perambulator into a biting wind to begin his 10-year walk around the world, accompanied by an assistant. 
the masked walker preferred that he be called the Iron Mask, and the press wondered how he could find someone willing to marry him without looking at his face. But they guessed, if he had a chance of winning $100,000, that there would be plenty of takers. As he left Trafalgar Square, he waved to the crowd and yelled, Farewell! See you in ten years! He then went over London Bridge with a large crowd following. He said, I shall sell photographs and pamphlets while on the journey. The perambulator was filled with them. He said that he needed to touch every county in England and visit Scotland, Ireland, and Wales along with 20 countries. Within 16 miles, he was stopped at Dartford, England and fined for selling photograph postcards without a peddler's license. The magistrate allowed the man to wear his mask in court, the fine was paid, and he resumed his journey. As word spread across the world about the crazy undertaking, comments were made. In Iowa, A mysterious individual left London upon a prospecting trip around the world under conditions so bizarre as to cause the affair to seem a ludicrous hoax. In Canada, The funny thing about the whole affair is the fact that the English press treat the matter seriously. In February 1908, his baby carriage broke down and he bought a new fancy one with good tires. The masked walker was described to be a sturdy and well set up man, and his conversation was said to betray that he possessed considerable education and culture. At Bexhill, England, a typical reaction was described. Naturally, he caused some excitement. Pushing a perambulator and, of course, wearing the iron mask is not exactly an ordinary spectacle. An interested crowd followed him wherever he went. Moreover, as one of the conditions is that he find a wife in Ralph, the feminine element was in great evidence. By the time he reached Devon, England, he said he had found his wife who was traveling with him in a caravan, but no one was allowed to see her. He started wearing a black silk mask at night while indoors. Once a chambermaid hid under the masked walker's bed in an attempt to identify him and claim a reward, but she was caught. Postcard sales were doing very well, and he had to order a new stock. Witnesses continued to see him walking through the summer of 1908 in England. The journey around the world came to an end at Woburn Sands, England in late September 1908. The masked walker explained why he quit. I have been wearing this four pound helmet daily for 10 months. I have wheeled the perambulator a distance of 2,400 miles. The strain began to take its toll on me. My eyes ached and I suffered from racking pains in my head. On several occasions I fainted by the roadside and sometimes I was even confined to my bed for two or three days at a stretch. I should have liked to have continued with it, but circumstances were too strong for me. He admitted that the wager was a tremendous hoax, but continued to claim that during his travels, he paid his own way by his postcard sales. He claimed that he received 200 proposals for marriage. Who was this masked man? Do you mind telling me who the masked man is? Wouldn't mind at all, except that I don't rightly know his real name. Harry Bensley was born in 1876 at Thetford, England, the son of a laborer in a sawmill. At an early age, he started to get into trouble. In 1890, at the age of 14, Bensley was accused of burning some stacks of barley, oats, and hay that belonged to a neighboring butcher. Hensley was brought to trial for a felony arson. It was believed that he had started a fire to keep warm and accidentally caught the stacks on fire. He was eventually acquitted because his employer gave an excellent character witness for him. In 1898, Bensley married Kate Green. But in 1902, he deserted his wife and children and went to London to take up a career of being a con artist. He married a barmaid, Lily Chapman, in 1903. She later found out that he was already married, but she stayed with him. After he conned some businessmen out of 367 pounds, he was on the run from police. He fled to South Africa with his wife, but in 1904 was apprehended in Cape Town. After taken back to England, he was found guilty of fraud and bigamy and was sentenced to four years in prison.
When Bensley was nearing his release from prison, he was concerned about what he would do for a living once out of jail. After reading the best-selling book, The Man in the Iron Mask, it inspired his plan for a hoax. I began to draw mental pictures of myself passing through life with an iron mask over my face. Gradually, they took shape and substance, and I began to evolve a scheme by means which I could make it a source of profit. I thought of several plans, until at last I hit upon the idea of walking around the world for a bogus wager. I spent the remaining weeks of my imprisonment perfecting my plans, writing each detail over and over again on my slate. After getting out, he obtained the mask and the perambulator, and then hired a young man to be his assistant, giving him false promises of a third of his winnings. After the iron mask hoax was over, Bensley faded away out of the public eye and apparently left the life of a con artist behind. In 1915, he joined the army as a private. But within a year, he was thrown out of the service. During World War II, he worked as a bomb checker at an ammunitions factory. Harry Bensley died in 1956 at the age of 79. Anton Hanslian of Vienna, Austria, was born in 1865. He was an artisan and married Leopoldine. They had a daughter, Polly, born in 1897. In 1900, the World Exposition, World's Fair, was held in Paris, France. Many people found unique ways to travel to the event. One man came on stilts, two others rolled a huge barrel there. Hans Leon decided that he would take his wife and daughter to the expo, walking all the way, pushing them in a perambulator, a large baby carriage. The Hans Leon successfully arrived in Paris a distance of 1,200 miles after less than two months in June 1900. While in Paris, Hans Leon said he met a wealthy man who offered him a wager if he could push his wife and daughter all the way around Europe in two years. He took up the challenge, built a larger, sturdier perambulator, and included a linen hood that could be raised in bad weather. Hans Leon needed to start without money, sent postcards from each place he visited, and obtained certificates from local officials. To raise money, the Hans Leons would sell postcards along the way. They started from Vienna, Austria on September 12, 1900. We left Vienna full of hope and joyous anticipation. We had no idea what tolls, difficulties, and dangers were before us. The weather was good and the people friendly, and the postcards we sold and the lectures I gave in the village inns brought us a goodly sum of money. Hans Leon's vehicle, with occupants and provisions, weighed more than 450 pounds. Under the seat was a compartment where he stored a tent, some sleeping blankets, and food. He first headed west and walked through Germany, where they spent a month living in the lap of luxury because of the generosity of the people. When they reached Holland, things were different because he didn't speak Dutch. He had difficulty even getting milk for little Polly. After walking through France, crossing the English Channel, and arriving in London two months into their trip, he spent the next few months walking and pushing through England, Ireland, and Scotland. About his wife was written, Tiring through his task may be child's play to that of his wife, who had to sit in the small vehicle all day, and often when she rises from it is so cramped that she can hardly stand. In England, only a few people took them into their homes for free. Instead of depleting their savings, they spent many nights in the open. We were protected only by our blankets and reserved clothes and by branches of trees against the inclement weather. Our humble meals, too, we took mostly outdoors, and they often consisted of nothing but potatoes while we baked in a wood fire. Hans Leon's wife, Leopoldine, became quite ill delaying them. They stayed in a run-down hut and suffered from hunger. Little Polly cried incessantly. On our third day without food, I saw a dog and in my desperation shot him with my revolver, impaled him on a stick, and cooked him over a roaring fire of twigs. We ate him with a relish. He said those were among the darkest days of their journey. Leaving Britain, they went to Denmark and later to Sweden. There, his wife became seriously sick again, and she spent four weeks in a hospital. 
By the time they left Sweden by ship back to Germany in April 1901, they were out of money. In May 1901, they entered the Baltics in Russia, Finland, and Poland. They had a scare in Hungary. One afternoon, I was laboriously pushing the perambulator in front of me while the child and my wife had fallen asleep when there suddenly appeared right in front of us on the high road a large animal which I almost immediately recognized with a thrill of horror as a tiger. He at first was paralyzed with fear as he stared at the beast. He remembered his revolver, but his shot went wild. His wife and daughter woke up and shrieked loud and long. That startled the tiger, and it moved off into the bushes. It turned out that the tiger had escaped from a zoo. We often joked that the tiger had not cared about attacking us because we had not enough flesh on our bones. They reached Italy and spent nine weeks walking through the country and still suffered from the lack of food. I sometimes had to push my pram the whole day without having eaten more than a bit of dry bread. I knocked one day at the door of a monastery and asked for some soup, but received the surly reply, We have no alms for Austrians. They were often chased away by dogs when trying to find shelter. Hans Leon pushed the perambulator through Switzerland, back into Germany, and then returned to his home in Vienna, Austria on July 10, 1902, after being away for 22 months and covering about 11,000 miles. It was said that he won the prize of $2,000. He estimated that he had sold more than 50,000 postcards. At the finish in Vienna, he looked sunburned, thin, and his face lined with deep wrinkles. It was obvious that they had suffered. Leopoldine Hans Leon also looked very worn, but in contrast to her parents, the six-year-old girl looked round-cheeked and bright, though her face and hands were as brown as those of a gypsy child. Hans Leon wanted to continue. He claimed to accept a new $10,000 deal with a Vienna sporting club to extend his walk to be around the world, pushing the carriage, returning within six years. On October 3rd, 1902, they set off again, heading through Germany, England, and on to America. After six months, they steamed from Liverpool, England, and arrived in New York City on April 9th. New Yorkers observed, Hans Leon is on a tour of the world. He pushes before him a wickerwork go-kart in which are seated his wife and child. He stows away the few utensils for camp cooking. The object of his journey is to walk around the world within six years. The vehicle is a chair much like those in use on boardwalks at seaside resorts. On their third day in the city, they were pedaling on Broadway. Members of the Children's Society became concerned and reported them to the police. They were arrested for vagrancy and charged with forcing their six-year-old daughter to beg. Hans Leon and his wife were sent back to Ellis Island, and Polly was being cared for by the Jerry Society. Immigration authorities finally ruled that they should be deported on the grounds that they were professional beggars. They all arrived back to Liverpool, England on March 6, 1903. They stayed in Great Britain for six months, earning money for a return trip. In July 1903, at Sunderland, England, Leopoldine Hansleon gave birth to a daughter, Rosa. She died two months later in London. Four months later, in November 1903, the Hansleon family again took a steamer across the Atlantic, this time to Quebec City, Canada. Leopoldine Hansleon was pregnant again, but still wanted to make the trip. In May 1904, when she was eight months along, after traveling many miles in Canada, they neared the U.S. border at Windsor, across the river from Detroit. A crowd of small boys followed him down the street in Windsor, tantalizing him with rude jibes. Hansleon mistook a man for being one of his tormentors and knocked him down with a monkey wrench. The man was just standing nearby watching. Before Hans Leon could be arrested, he hustled onto a ferry and crossed the border over to Detroit. At Grand Junction, Michigan, Leopoldine Hans Leon gave birth to a daughter, Bertie Emily Hans Leon. Oddly, the baby didn't continue the journey with them. They evidently found a family to care for her, and they never came back together. 
She would be raised in Michigan, where she would live until her marriage in 1921. The Hanzelians continued on. At St. Louis, Missouri, they visited the World's Fair and gave appearances there. But Hanzelian soon became very ill. They had to stay many weeks in the city and depleted their funds. After being in North America for a year, they arrived in Topeka, Kansas, where Hans Leon spent a few days repairing the carriage. He was being called the Champion Walker of the World. For some reason, Hans Leon started to fabricate their story, which is a shame because he still appeared to be walking without taking rides. He was telling people they started their American walk at New York City instead of coming from Quebec City, Canada. The appearance of Hans Leon is as strange as that of his cart and its load. He wears short knickerbockers and a heavy green sweater. His face is tanned and ruddy and his shoulders rounded from walking. But the muscles protrude from his arms and the calves of his legs like bumps on a log. He now claimed to be able to speak 22 languages. He was still in Kansas in December, and it was commented, The fellow is smart, well-educated, and appears to be an ordinary human freak. Five months later, at the end of April 1905, they were still making slow progress and arrived in San Antonio, Texas. It had now been nearly two and a half years since they left their home in Austria for this walk around the world. He said that the roads in America were by far the worst of any he had traveled, but he did like the people of the country. Soon afterwards, they contracted yellow fever and also struggled getting stuck on sandy Texas hills. They decided to abandon their westward walk near El Paso, Texas. While heading back near Houston, Leopoldine Hans Leon gave birth again on September 1st, 1905. Sadly, either the child died or they again found a family to care for the infant because it was not with the Hanslians later on. In December, they were in Louisiana. He attracted considerable attention on the streets while gaping crowds gathered around the strange man and his cart in which were seated his family of two. He has many amusing tales of adventure to relate and like all world travelers, has had many close chases with death. On his way to New York City, Hans Leon's tales became more and more embellished. The tiger story moved from Hungary to Africa, where he falsely claimed to have been in Cape Town. He also dishonestly said that he had made it all the way to San Francisco and then headed into Mexico on his way back east. In September 1906, they were in Pennsylvania. Leopoldine Hansleon commented that she was tired of spending her life traveling in the carriage. She was again pregnant. At Pittsburgh, he set up his tent in an amusement park, Luna Park, for a free exhibition to attract people to the new park. He said he earned $1,500 while at Pittsburgh. At Chambersburg, Pennsylvania in November, they no longer could stay in their tent because of the cold weather and were dependent on finding generous lodging in hotels. Hans Leon went in search of a room while his wife and daughter guarded their belongings. Each of the hotels said they were full. He returned to his family and told them the bad news. The crowd there was annoyed because they knew there were actually plenty of rooms. The newspaper eventually let them stay at their office. This was gladly accepted, and a hasty bed was made with blankets carried by the party. After some food had been eaten, obtained at a restaurant, the mother and daughter went to sleep. By the end of November 1906, they arrived in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He told a false tale about his travels in Arizona, where he didn't go. For four days, the travelers went without water and were only saved from death by a slight rainfall which he caught in an outspread canvas. He claimed that since his trek began, that he had worn out 95 pair of shoes and 8 suits of clothes. At the end of the year, 1906, the Hanslians were welcomed into New York City, the same city that tossed them out less than three years earlier. On February 6, 1907, Leopoldine gave birth to her third child while in America, a son, Robert Hanslian, in New Jersey. 
It is again puzzling that they again gave their infant away. A Lorenz family took him in. It is believed that they intended to come back to claim him, but the Lorenz family eventually adopted him. He was raised in Queens, New York, and lived in New York City for many years. The Hans Leons left America during the spring of 1907, going back to England. Sadly, on July 1st, 1907, Leopoldine Hanslian died of tuberculosis at Sunderland, England, at the age of 32. Some newspapers stated that she died from a nervous attack caused by being arrested as a spy in China, where she never went. Another paper probably more correctly stated that she died of fatigues of the road. Would Hans Leon stop? Would he go back for his children left in America? No. He continued on with Polly. In August 1907, he was interviewed in London and told many falsehoods about their travels. We crossed North and South America, Africa, Australia, and China. He said in Arizona that they had been attacked by wolves and drove them off by firing guns. They met Indians in the West and slept in their wigwams. In China, he said that they were arrested as a spy. He commented, The load is lighter now, for my wife died in Sunderland. Hans Leon claimed that they returned to Vienna, Austria on October 29, 1907 after being away for more than seven years. A newspaper announced that Hans Leon won the wager somehow, that he walked 31,250 miles, averaging 12 miles per day, and took 18,000 photographs. It is estimated that he actually walked about 20,000 miles. He traversed Europe, America, Australia, and China and got into trouble during the Russo-Japanese War, narrowly escaping being shot as a spy. The article stated that he only won half of the $10,000 because his wife had died before returning. Hans Leon died that year in 1908. By 1900, strangely, some ultra walkers started to roll large and even enormous barrels along the way as they walked. Do a barrel roll! Two Austrians rolled a barrel more than 1,000 miles to the Paris World Exposition in 1900. Others copied their feet. On June 20th, 1909, two Italians, Italia Zanardi and Eugenio Vianello, left Venice, Italy wheeling a huge custom barrel for a $10,000 prize to roll it around the world in 12 years. They started without money and planned to live on selling postcards and putting on exhibitions of their rolling home. The two only spoke Italian and carried a book to be signed by officials of the towns they passed through. The barrel, which is of their own manufacture, is divided into two compartments, one of which is provided with a swivel seat in which one of the travelers sits while his companion pushes the strange vehicle. The interior is so constructed that one of the travelers can be seated inside, retaining always an upright position while his companion pushes the barrel along the road. They take turns at doing this. Half of the inside of the barrel was constructed as a kitchen, while the other half was used as the seating compartment. The entire barrel could be used as a bedchamber for both walkers. It was made of oak, reinforced with iron hoops. It was six feet long, four feet high, weighing 480 pounds, but nearly 900 pounds with their contents. After four months, the two rolled into Paris, France. They were escorted out of Paris by a brass band of the Paris Barrel Makers Union. They next headed to the coast and then crossed the English Channel to Dover, England. They arrived in London, England at the five-month mark and appeared at the Palace Theatre sharing their experiences thus far. Their rate of progress had averaged about 18 miles per day. They said that their toughest stretch of road was going up and over Simplon Pass in Switzerland. They rolled their barrel to the summit in 36 hours and descended the other side in four. Unfortunately, the rapid rate of progress had the results of damaging their barrel slightly. Two dogs started with them, but both died due to the physical difficulty of the trip. In Switzerland, they obtained a St. Bernard puppy, which rode in the barrel while young, and then provided protection along the way. From Germany, they claimed to travel through Russia, Austria, Spain, and Portugal. They said that they had been attacked by a gang of robbers with a giant St. Bernard dog in a Russian mountain pass. 
One of the travelers received stab wounds in the arm and stomach, but both succeeded in making their escape after leaving a memento of their proficiency in the art of self-defense in the canine in which they stretched lifeless on the ground during the struggle. More than three years into their travels, on December 4th, 1913, the two arrived at New York City from France on the French liner Niagara. They were listed as tourists on the ship manifest. They claimed that they had covered about 24,000 miles during the past three years in Europe and immediately started rolling towards Yonkers, New York. They arrived at Princeton, New Jersey on January 28, 1910, setting their mileage at 26,665 miles. They explained that they are bound for San Francisco and that their long beards were accounted for the fact that they had pledged themselves not to shave until the end of their journey. The Italians were now being called Kings of the Cask. They were said to look like twin Rimp Van Winkles. After America, they planned to roll through Australia, Asia, Africa, and then back to Venice. From April to July 1914, they rolled their barrel across Pennsylvania. At Altoona, with a large Italian population, they were escorted into the city by an Italian band. At the city limits, they were stopped by authorities demanding that they obtain a permit, which they did at City Hall after a long explanation as to what they were doing. They are frequently required to sleep in their barrel. When they do this, their dogs take up a position about 15 feet on either side of the barrel and give alarm in case a person approaches. They make an average of three miles per hour on good roads where there are not too many hills. Roll out the barrel. Roll out the barrel. Yes, we'll have the barrel of fun. We'll have a barrel of fun. Witnesses watch them go from town to town. They have two small dogs that trot along with them, oftentimes running along the top of the cask while it is in motion. The men cover an average distance daily of about 15 miles, sometimes attaining 20 to 25 miles when the roads and weather are unusually good. At Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in June 1914, police confiscated their barrel for a while until the two could explain what they were doing. Once it was learned that they were out of money, the police put them up at their station. The two said that a condition of their wager was for them to pick up a dog each year and that in New York, a gang took their four dogs and their belongings. They now had just one dog that walked along the top of the barrel as it rolled. Dozens of Pittsburgh Italians gathered to greet their fellow countrymen. Both men were in excellent health, and the dog showed no signs of becoming busy as the party left Pittsburgh. The two suddenly stopped their barrel rolling for several years. Vianello settled in Detroit, Michigan, and served in World War I as a private. He applied for American citizenship in 1920 and was employed as a waiter. Zanardi settled in Chicago and registered for the World War I draft while living there. In July 1921, Zanardi showed up at Rockford, Illinois, rolling the barrel again with a new partner, Lorenzo Villegren. They said they needed to complete their journey by 1924. Nothing more was heard about their trek. Vianello died in 1956. Others would attempt crazy stunts going around the world, such as walking backwards, a man even tried to circle the globe wearing handcuffs, getting continually arrested when the police thought he was an escaped prisoner. Stay tuned for the next episode when the story of the first verified walk around the world will be told. With that, this is Davy Crockett, and this is the Ultra Running History Podcast. I hope you run fast and far, enjoy life, get outdoors, and most of all, stay safe and don't take unnecessary chances. <music>